Intramuros is very important to us because of the lessons in heritage and history. Siguro in one line no, ng objective ng Bahay Chinoy, establish our rightful place in the Philippine sun. Nag, uh, bukas ito sa public noong 1999, no? uh, inilalarawan nito ang bahagi at ang impact ng mga Chinese Filipinos in all aspects of Philippine life. I wish that the Bahay Chinoy can be recognized in the whole Intramuros and the whole Philippine society. I wish all the visitors, the audience, regardless of race, regardless of origin, regardless of your religion, can be recognized as part of this nation and as part of this uh, nation building and the history of the Philippines. Ako po si Teresita Angsi, founding president ng Kaisa Para sa Kaunlaran, at ngayon ay executive trustee ng Kaisa Heritage Foundation na nagmamanage sa Bahay Chinoy Museum of the Chinese in Philippine Life. For me, Intramuros is our past, present, and our future. And because of that, it is very important in our lives. We must be involved and engaged in Intramuros. And we, as citizens, must do everything to keep it alive, to keep it vibrant, because it is the archive of our history. It is the archive of who we are as a people. President and CEO of Distillery Limtuaco and the fifth generation master blender and distiller of the oldest distillery in the Philippines. So our company was established in 1852 and it was our founder is uh, Don Bonifacio Limtuaco who came from China, Fujian, China, and he introduced to the Philippines this product called Shok Hok Tong, which eventually became the generic term. Uh, for Chinese medicinal wine, Shoktong. And so uh, we are very much part of the history of the Philippines through our liquor making with 167 years of history and legacy that we have shared with this country. Well, Intramuros is very important because this was really the seat of um, governmental power and uh, trade culture, religion, and we're very proud to be part of Intramuros now through our museum. While our role in Intramuros is really to provide another tourist spot, you know, another tourist spot where through our museum, tourists can learn more about our country, about our products, about our industry. And uh, we're very proud to be given that opportunity to participate, you know, in promoting culture through food. Well, I would really love that Intramuros would be teeming with tourists, with young people working in this place, celebrating our history and our culture and sharing it with the rest of the world similar to what other countries are doing. For instance, like in Tallinn, Estonia, where they have a medieval, medieval walled city. I wish uh, our Intramuros would be not just like that, but maybe even better, you know? So it would be um, really a living walled city of the past, the present, and the future. Ang mga binibenta ko po pagkain na ulam, adobo, sinigang, caldereta, pork chop, fried chicken, and 
may mga gulay, pakbe, tsaka chapsoy. Karamihan na kumakain sa akin, nagtrabaho sa Mapua, mga empleyado. Tapos, estudyante rin ng Mapua, ay si yung Manila High. Ayun po, nakakatulong ng tindahan po namin sa Intramuros, lalo na po ang sana may malaking bagay po sa mga estudyante at mga empleyado sa Intramuros na nagtatrabaho. Kasi, uh, pang masa po ang presyo. 40 years na po ako nakatira sa Intramuros, nararasan na namin yung hirap, baha. <laughs> Para sa amin, ang Intramuros, malaking bagay kasi dito na buhay mga anak ko, dito ako nagpalaki ng mga anak ko, dito, dito ko kinuha yung pampalaki ng mga anak ko, maaral. Kaya ang Intramuros, malaking bagay sa amin. Dito na rin nag-aaral ng mga anak ko ng high school, elementary sa Quiapo, Mabini, sa high school sa Manila High School, sa Intramuros. Ako, ako po si Edna Apable. Merong isang karindirya sa Intramuros. Ang ginagawa ko po, namamalik sa madaling araw. Nagluluto, nagtitinda. Ang pangarap ko po sa Entramuro, sana huwag kami mawala at habang buhay kami makapaghanap buhay sa Entramuro. So, naging special sa akin yung Intramuros dahil uh, dito rin ako nakatira. So, dito na rin ako uh, kumuku uh, kumukuha para sa hanap na buhay namin. And then, ang Intramuros din para sa akin is parang isang tahanan na rin para sa akin. So, ang role ko dito sa Intramuros ay parang uh, tayo naging nag-a-attract or nagpapa-attract sa mga turista dito sa loob ng Intramuros para kahit pa paano makita rin nila yung kagandahan ng Intramuros. Ako nga pala si Valentino Mejia, isang e-trike driver dito sa Intramuros. So ang nakikita ko sa future ng Intramuros is uh, lalawak pa yung uh, ating turismo dito sa loob ng Intramuros and then talaga makikilala ang Intramuros sa buong Pilipinas, hindi lang sa buong Pilipinas, sa buong mundo. Ang Intramuros, isa sa pinakamahalagang lugar dito sa buong Pilipinas. Ito ay isa sa pinaka-historical place. Ay naitutulong ng isang kutsero ay, ay may turo sa mga bawat na mga masyal kung anong mahalagang lugar dito sa Intramuros. Mga rule ng mga kutsero ay kailangan Uh, panatili, malinis ang lugar, apo sa uh, mag-inopome, at sunod, sundin ang mga alituntunin ng Intramuros. Dito sa Intramuros, sana uh, sa araw o bawat sanlinggo, Bigyan nila ng uh, 
mga libre na mga lugar para lalong pasyalan ng mga namamasyal dito sa Intramuros. Yung iba kasi uh, namamasyal dito, hindi nakakapasok sa mga lugar-lugar kasi may mga bayan. Ako po pala si Romeo M. Javier bilang isang kutsero at bilang isang tour guide sa Intramuros. Dito rin ako nabubuhay at nabubuhay ang aking pamilya. Kaya malaking malaking tulong ang Intramuros sa buhay ng bawat isang kutsero dito. Dahil po sa isang hanap buhay na marangal na nagpipidikap. Dati po akong waiter ng Tama Skatering. Ngayon, nagpipidikap na po ako dahil marami pong turista dito sa loob ng Intramuros. Nandito po ako sa Intramuros, 1994. Bukod po sa pagpipidikap, tinitrain po kami ng DOT sa pag-guide ng tour and guide sa Intramuros. Sa darating na panahon, marami pa pong mga improvement ang Intramuros dahil sa IA, sa maintenance, sa kalinisan, kayusan. Ah, good morning po. Ako po si Gerald Abillar. Ang trabaho po dito ay nagpipidikab. Uh, ang gusto pang mangyari dito sa loob ng Intramuros ay ma-improve yung kagandahan, maraming matulungan na barangay. I've been a resident of Intramuros for half of my life and my children has grown to love this place. We are trying to promote um, Intramuros through our venue because uh, we feel that this is one way of inviting tourists to come and experience Intramuros. is actually the ancestral house of my husband. So this is where he grew up. So he's been here for like his entire lifetime. So it really means a lot, not only to him and his family, but to us also. We would like Intramuros to be a premier tourist destination. My name is Cosette Chua. I am the managing director of uh, Pavilion de la Castellana. We are working closely with the administrator to further improve what we have. I believe that this is the only historical place that's left in Manila. In my own little way, I would like to think that I can contribute um, uh, to its historical value. Uh, very unique, uh, one of its kind. It's a historical zone, actually. No? You have lots of museum in and out of the walls. No? Mm, Jaime Jimmy Lim. Uh, I I've started doing business here in 1988. I opened a. Uh, small retail shop catering to Mapua students just in front of OWA, Overseas Worker Welfare Administration. And my main customer is Mapua. So now we thought of putting up this 
training center institute right in the heart of Intramuros. No? What, what better place because it, it is a university hub as you can see it, they, we have five universities here and one middle school. We need more of the exist current administrator to see a better Intramuros. No? I'm very happy right now with the current administrator. Then what I hope for is a cleaner Intramuros. I hope all the stakeholders inside Intramuros will come together. Uh, we cannot all be leaders. Let's just follow on, uh, the leader who is giving us the right direction. Sa akin, special yung Intramuros no, uh, dahil sa punong-puno ng historia, historical Intramuros. Napamahal na rin po ako dito sa Intramuros dahil dito po ako nagtatrabaho. Ako po si Christian Roa. Ako ay isang security guard ng Intramuros bilang isang uh, batipunera po. Uh, itutulong ko po dito sa Intramuros na Mapanatili po yung mga kalinisan, kayusan, at matiwasay na pagpapatupad. Next week ko po dito sa Intramuros dahil po sa lalong tumatagal, gumaganda siya at dumarami yung mga turista na pumibisita dito. AMOSUP, Associated Marine Officer Siemens Union of the Philippines. Ang AMSUP ay ito ay isang union ng mga Siemens, exclusive lang sa kanila. Ang AMSUP members ko namin ay nagagaling na ibang ba, ibang iba't ibang lugar sa Pilipinas. Dito na lahat nagsama-sama. Puro mga, mga Siemens lahat mga yan. Dito sa ginagawa ko rito, na-assist ko po yung mga, mga members namin, mga union members, kasi exclusive lang sa kanila para dito sa dormitory. Ang, may, ang contribution ko sa Intro Muros ay siguro pangalagahan itong lugar na ito. Ang Intro Muros importante sa akin dahil dito ako magkatrabaho at wala na po ibang mapuntaan na dahil sa edad natin. Kaya Importante sa akin yung Intramuros. Ako si Jawel Carino, nagtitrabaho rito sa Amusu. Ako ay bilang supervisor sa dormitory. Ako ay 16 years rito sa Amusu Cellar Zoom. Ang may contribute ko rito sa Intramuros bilang isang empleyado, supervisor sa Amusu, kailang mapangalagaan yung mga member para sa kanilang contribution sa ating bansa. As a child, I would frequent the uh, Intramuros because of our educational field trip. We would usually go to uh, the Manila Cathedral. So it's part of my childhood memory. Uh, little did I know that after many years, I would be a resident of, of Intramuros. The Manila Cathedral started as a small parish church here in the same spot. Uh, in 1571, when we talk of Manila, especially during the Spanish times, it was Intramuros. 
And the Manila Cathedral is in the heart of Manila, which is Intramuros, uh, being the first cathedral in the Philippines, the center of uh, Philippine governance. This was also the center of Philippine, uh, Philippine faith. Religion, especially Christianity, is not just about doctrines. Religion is about relationship. Young people are so engrossed in an activity, especially when they see that what they are doing is something that, uh, that benefits others. And I think the church provides them with many opportunities for that. I wish that Intramuros to be a place where uh, tourists are enriched when it comes to their discovery of their faith. I am uh, Father Reginald R. Malikdem. I am the rector of the Manila Cathedral since July of 2015. Uh, little did I know that after many years, I would be asked to take care of uh, Mother Church of the Philippines of Intramuros. When I started out with the Department of Tourism, we wanted the theme or to be the overarching theme to be a culture of sustainable tourism. And what's good with uh, Intramuros administration is that we should preserve it because it's a, a historical and a cultural site. And Intramuros is uh, what we can call one of our national treasures. And I want the Intramuros, uh, the district of Intramuros, it's not where you go for field trips or weddings or photo shoots. It should be a place where everybody would like to go to, um, to enjoy the sites. And it's like a place where it's like going back in time. Intramuros is a place, I think, that a living urban heritage district. It's where you have history and culture come to life. I'm Bernadette Romulo Puyat. I'm the Secretary of Tourism and also the Chairperson of the Intramuros Administration. Intramuros should promote the cultures and values of Malasakit and Malikain.
Welcome everyone to the 21st episode of the Intramuros Learning Session. So, this uh, session is brought to you by the Intramuros Administration and the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation. Uh, before we start, uh, let me announce first some house rules. If you would like to ask questions, you may send it through the Q&A button, which is also found in the lower portion of the screen. That is if you are viewing via Zoom. If you are viewing via Facebook, you may send in your questions in the comment section. Please note that we will do our best to accommodate all of the questions subject to the availability of our speaker should we exceed the time limit. Only those who have successfully registered and viewed on Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate. A feedback form will be emailed to you after the session and a certificate will be sent within a week. If you are unable to attend the webinar, please let us know now so we can give a slot to another registrant. Ensure that your audio is okay, wear your reliable set of headphones, don't be shy to ask questions, and most importantly, get yourself comfortable and enjoy. Now, our first, uh, our topic for today is about your, the heroines of World War II. So this is part two of uh, the Heroes of World War II series under the Intramuros Learning Session by our uh, speaker, Desiree Ancuva Banipayo from the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation in the Memorare Manila, 1945. Now in part one of Heroes of World War II, we discussed three distinguished heroes, uh, Jose Abad Santos, Jose Fayanis Skoda, and Vicente Lim. Now, for this session on, on part two of Miss Winnipeg's talk, we're going to discuss or we're going to focus on 15 feminine figures who fought during the Second World War. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, many of you already know our speaker because she has been with us before in the Intramuros Learning Session twice already. And we are happy to have her again for the third time. So Ms. Desiree Benipayo, she is a writer and a film producer. She's currently the Vice President for Research and Education at the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation and the Secretary at the Memo Memorare Manila 1945. Ms. Benipayo is the author of Honor, The Legacy of Jose Abad Santos, which was recently awarded Best Book of Non-Fiction Prose in English in the 2019 National Book Awards. Together with her husband, she also produced a film documentary adaptation of her book, which received an A rating by the Philippine Cinema Evaluation Board. Now, uh, without further ado, may I call on our distinguished speaker to deliver her presentation, Ms. Des. Good afternoon, Ranch. Good afternoon to everybody who's watching this afternoon. Uh, maulan po yung hapon, so masarap makinig. <laughs> Hindi mainit, ano? So, ayun nga po. Um, we'll be starting our lecture on the heroines of World War II. Last time, we featured the three World War II heroes on the 1,000 peso bill. Now, we will feature the women, women uh, resistance fighters of World War II. So, I'll start. Um, when the Japanese started their reign of terror, they exercised authoritarian rule and used brute force to subjugate the population. Severe punishments were meted out for minor offenses, and humiliating slaps greeted those who did not bow low enough to the Japanese guards. Civil liberties were removed, personal freedoms lost, and anyone suspected of anti-Japanese sentiments were tortured and killed. These cruel treatment, coupled with many incidences of rape, looting, and plunder spurred the formation of the resistance. 
Many women with access to grind joined the resistance to seek retribution for loved ones killed by the enemy. They served the gamut of roles as doctors and nurses tending the sick, the wounded, and the dying, as commanders leading their men in the front lines, as spies, saboteurs, couriers, recruiters, and organizers. Like their male counterparts, these Filipina resistance fighters took on their share of the ordeals of war, enduring starvation and malaria in the mountains and jungles, risking life and limb for the love of country. No other occupied people in Southeast Asia fought harder and resisted more stubbornly than us Filipinos. In Yai Panilio's letter to Commander Chick Parsons in 1944, she said, If I were to tell you about all the wonderful guerrillas in the country, I could give you just the population census. Often also overlooked is the fact, and one that we should be very proud of, is that no other occupied country in Southeast Asia had more women involved in the resistance than in the Philippines. Historians have estimated that one in every 10 guerrillas was a female, yet women's role in the resistance gets far less attention than it should get. So join me in the next hour as we learn about the lives and heroism of these intrepid women warriors of World War II. Let us start our discussion with the courageous women commanders of Pampanga. Very early in the war, way before the Hukbalahap was formed, and way before Bataan surrendered, Commander Dayang Dayang and Commander Maming had already organized their own guerrilla units to defend their towns. Their early victories against the Japanese show that the small guerrilla movement can defeat a superior enemy and inspired many groups to organize in this manner. Felipe, Felipa Kulala chose the alias Dayang Dayang in honor of a fierce Muslim warrior princess. She started forming a guerrilla group of 35 men with arms taken from landlords who had fled to Manila. <clears throat> One day during harvest season, the constabulary arrested eight of their members. She then led their men to the municipal hall and freed their comrades. In reprisal, the Japanese sent a patrol to their barrio, but Dayang Dayang's troops, now numbering 110, were ready. They killed 40 Japanese and 68 constabulary troops. This was in early March 1942, a full month before the fall of Bataan. Word of Dayang Dayang's victory spread, so she was invited by Luis Taruk to join the Hukbalahap or Hukbo ng Bayan Laban sa Hapon on March 29, 1942. Dayang Dayang became the only female member of the military committee along with Luis Taruk, Castro Alejandrino, and Bernardo Poblete. They were all members of Pedro Abad Santos' Socialist Party. Soon after, there were complaints that Dayang Dayang wants to be treated like a queen ordering pigs and chickens to be killed and cooked upon her arrival. According to Taruk, she disliked taking orders from other leaders. She was court-martialed, found guilty of abuse of power, and was executed by a firing squad. Some Hook veterans later claimed that the charges against her were falsified by Taruk, who became jealous of her fame. Whether the accusations against her were true or not, she was still a legend in the central plains of Luzon, and inspired many women to join the resistance. Another brave commander is Elena Poblete, also known as Commander Maming. She was an officer in the Banal guerrilla force, organized by her father, Bernardo Poblete, alias Jose Banal. Commander Jose Banal was a former Philippine scout from 1907 to 1911 and settled in Minalin as a farmer. In January 1942, he heard rumors of Japanese atrocities and rapes and decided to form his own group to safeguard his town. His first members were his wife and nine children, and soon their number grew. Like Dayang Dayang, Banal's group was formed before the formal establishment of the Hukbalahap. In 1943, the Japanese strengthened their offensive in central Luzon, engaging Banal and his men in bloody combats. In one mission, after a long cat-and-mouse chase, Commander Maming told her men to rest in a secluded portion of the Minalin River. But somebody might have tipped them off, for very early the next day, the Japanese started attacking. Commander Maming ordered her men to disperse in small groups while she defended the main line. She was shot by the enemy, the bullet piercing above her right brow. Commander Banal lost his daughter Elena and three more sons during the war, but he soldiered on. It is worth noting that of all the Hook regiments, only Banal's group was recognized by the U.S. Army, for they were not tainted with communist ideologies. Um, last year, our team went to Minalin to research about Commander Jose Banal and Commander Maming. 
And uh, we had to ride the banka, as you see on the left, to get to where uh, Commander Maming was, was shot. No? And the old man in the picture, the one in the purple shirt, is 98-year-old Jacinto Cunanan. Uh, bulag na nga po siya, no? uh, because of age. And he was a member of Commander Maming's squadron. And he vividly told us how Commander Maming died. Uh, yun nga, no? a, a bullet pierced, pierced right through her brow, sa taas daw po ng kilay. And on the uh, left of uh, Mr. Kunanen is Rico Suba. Kuya Rico is the grandson of Commander Jose Banal. And he is our point guy de there every time we go to, for research, siya po yung nag arrange for us. And then on the right is the centuries-old Minalin Church. I put it here because it's really worth seeing. And inside the convento at the second floor, meron po diyang mural, 17th century mural, na sana po uh, matulungan tayo ng... Uh, ating government na ma-preserve siya. Uh, medyo fading na nga po yung mga paint. So, calling-calling po kung sino ang pwedeng uh, any shipy probably to help in the restoration of the mural in the old Minalin Church. Alright, so now we go to our third uh, guerrilla commander. One of the highest ranking female hooks was Remedios Gomez of Mexico, Pampanga. Her father, Basilio Gomez, was the town vice mayor and also a member of Pedro Abad Santos' Socialist Party. When the Japanese were marching through their town, he ordered the townsfolk to gather their arms and resist the Japanese. However, they got defeated, and her father was publicly tortured and executed as a warning to the others if they don't cooperate. As punishment, his remains were not given back to the family. With a score to settle, she joined the hooks. She was baptized Commander Liwaiwai and was trained in jungle warfare. Guerrilla tactics can be learned, Liwaiwai said but only perfected through actual encounters. Aside from winning many battles, she also became known as the lipstick-wielding commander. Before going to battles, she put on makeup and polished her nails. She said this gave her men confidence to be fighting under a commander who was fearless yet calm. She didn't tolerate sexual harassment either and challenged her comrade named Katapatan to a duel as she was so sick and tired of his sexual innuendos and advances. She passed away in 2014 at the age of 95. But before she died, she said these important words. Filipino women played an important role during the war. Like their male counterparts, they held important positions and dedicated their lives to driving away the Japanese invaders. I hope that someday, the role of these unsung heroines will find a place in history. By mid-1942, many guerrilla groups had sprouted all over the country. One of the largest guerrilla groups in Luzon was Marking's Guerrillas, headed by Marcos Villa Agustin, a bus driver and professional boxer before the war. The rise of his guerrilla force, in part, is attributable to the women in the group, foremost of which is Yai Panlilio, touted as the brains of Marking's, and Lydia Villanueva Arguilla, who became Marking's aide-de-camp. Yai Panlilio was born in Denver, Colorado in 1913 to a Filipina mother and Irish father. Her mother nurtured Yai's dream of becoming a writer, gifting the teenaged Yai with a typewriter. She married fellow Filipino Eduardo Panlilio, who was offered a mining engineer's job in the Philippines. So they settled here where they had three children, but the marriage did not last long and Eduardo died in the early days of the war. Smart, feisty, and headstrong, Yai became a reporter for the Philippines Herald and a broadcaster for KZRH. Yung KZRH po, yan yung uh, ama ng DZRH, which is still uh, broadcasting till today. Yai was the finest and most famous female reporter before the war. She was also sworn in as U.S. Army Intelligence Officer with badge number 67. During the occupation, the Japanese got her to do the news broadcasts in English, for KZRH. In between Japanese censored news broadcasts, Yai subtly inserted messages and innuendos, giving key information to the Philippine American troops fighting in Bataan and warned Manileños of things to come. The Japanese found out and ordered her arrest. With the help of friends, she went into hiding in a farm in Tanay where she met the guerrillas of Marking. She joined the group and became Marking's right hand, advising him on many important matters. Fondly called Mammy by the boys, she ran the camp and nursed the sick and the wounded. She handled documentation and paperwork, made reports and propaganda materials, and wrote letters to rich, influential friends in Manila for support. 
And she would always sign her letter at the po. More victories ahead. Yay. Uh, if you notice, more victories ahead is MVA. Parang shortcut for Marcos Villa Agustin. <laughs> In a tribute by the guerrillas of marking after the war, they wrote, To Mami Yai, always first in our hearts. Your memory will never fade, for you are right here in our hearts, card for all eternity. During our three-year sojourn in the rugged Sierras, you have been our guiding light. You comforted and consoled us when we were low, you advised us when you found it necessary, and you bawled us out when we did wrong. In 1950, she wrote her autobiography, The Crucible, which recounts her life as a guerrilla in the rugged mountain fastness of the Sierra Madres. The book, for one, is a landmark in literary history, for it was the first Filipino-authored book published by a big U.S. publisher. In the book, Yai emphasizes her biracial traits. <clears throat> her American upbringing being the source of her principles of democracy and fairness, and her belief that women are equal to men, and her Filipino blood as the source of her passion and devotion to the cause. She wrote, Filipinos will die for love, and Americans will die for principle. I am half and half. I die the same way. Most importantly, she wrote the book to publicize the important and unrecognized contributions of the Filipino guerrillas and to recognize the role of the women in the resistance. After the war, Yai and Marking were married and spent much of the post-war years working for the recognition of Filipino guerrillas. In 1950, this iconic female guerrilla received her Medal of Freedom from the U.S. government for her work during the war. Another important female figure in Marking's guerrillas was Lydia Villanueva Arguilla. Lydia Arguilla finished journalism at the University of the Philippines and was married to famous writer Manuel Arguilla. When war broke out, the couple joined Marking's guerrillas as secret underground agents. But they were soon found out, and Manuel was captured, tortured, and executed by the Japanese. Before he was caught, he ominously told Lydia that should anything happen to him, she should run to the hills to Marking and Yai. This she did and spent the rest of the remaining war years with Marking's guerrillas. To alleviate her grief, she buried, she buried herself in guerrilla work and soon became Marking's aide-de-camp. <clears throat> Lydia and Yai worked in tandem, writing propaganda and letters, tending to the sick and the wounded, and managing the camp. Lydia Argilia brought new dimensions into the guerrillas' world. Discussions, sophisticated humor, intellectual stimulation, and formed a new comradeship in the mountains. Yai would write of Lydia, For me, there is no woman in this world with Lydia's courage. There is no woman I would rather have for a sister. She came to us needing comfort and became our comfort. But perhaps one of Lydia's most important contributions to Philippine society was the establishment of the Philippine Art Gallery in 1950. The gallery was devoted to Philippine modern art, and supported the growing modern artists like H.R. Ocampo, <clears throat> Ang Kiukok, Nena Sagil, Arturo Luz, and many more. They called her gallery the meeting place of modern art, and Lydia, the mother of modern Philippine art. <clears throat> Our next hero had a very different kind of contribution to the war effort. Maria Orosa took up pharmacy at UP in 1915 and was sent to the University of Washington in Seattle, where he finished her bachelor's degree in food chemistry and master's degree in pharmacy. On her return to the Philippines, she was hired by the Bureau of Science as food chemist and later on became the head of the Food Preservation Division. So in this photo on the lower right, um, President Manuel Quezon was visiting the Bureau and, and there was uh, Ms. Maria Orosa welcoming the President. Her goal was to make the Philippines self-sufficient and not reliant on imported food products. She experimented on, experimented on local foods and came up with 700 recipes. Many of her inventions are being sold commercially today, like sweetened makapuno, calamansi juice concentrate, banana chips, but perhaps the most famous is the banana ketchup, a staple in almost all Filipino households. In 1942, Magdalo Francisco set up a factory, mass-producing it under the brand name Mafran. Recruited by Lydia Arguilla, she joined Marking's Guerrillas, and was given the guerrilla name Angge. Through the guerrilla network, two of her inventions would be smuggled into prison camps. These are soya lak, a protein-rich soybean product, and darak cookies, made of rice and high in vitamin B complex to fight beriberi. These magic foods saved thousands of lives in the guerrilla and internment camps. 
An interesting anecdote about her is that she was a fashionista. Her nieces and nephews remember their aunt as a well-dressed woman who loved wearing shiny shoes and was one of the few women in Manila who drove her own car at that time. She was at her post at the height of the Battle of Manila in February 1945 when she was hit by a shrapnel and was immediately rushed to the Remedios Hospital in Malate. Sadly, the hospital was also bombed, and this time, a fatal shrap shrapnel hit her right in her heart. Lately, there has been much interest in the life of Maria Orosa, as an excavation team from UP unearthed a marker bearing Orosa's name at the Malate Catholic School. This discovery, made exactly 75 years after her death, is such a fitting tribute to an incredible Filipina, who has remained forgotten by our nation. This next group of women are remarkable for soliciting aid, <clears throat> bringing food and supplies to guerrillas and internment camps, and thus help, the sa thus help save the lives of many. But the other side to this aid giving is their dangerous underground work of gathering intel, smuggling letters and messages, quinine, and other contrabands, which, when found out, will surely mean death. This takes courage, and these women have it. Josefa Borromeo Capistrano, sometimes called Mindanao's Gabriela Silang, was a Chinese mestiza originating from Cebu, who formed the Women's Auxiliary Service in Misamis Occidental in 1943. They provided food, clothing, and medical treatment to the resistance fighters and to the local community. It spread to Lanao and Zamboanga and had 3,000 women members at its peak. Not only were these brave women treating the wounded and feeding the hungry, they were also doing intelligence and reconnaissance work for the guerrillas. In one mission in downtown Misamis, she was almost trapped by the Japanese, but her strong intuition prevailed and she was able to escape. After the war, she continued to push for gender equality by not accepting any honors or awards until the women's auxiliary services be made an official part of the military. Because of her laudable efforts, the Women's Auxiliary Service, renamed the Women's Auxiliary Corps, became an official part of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, managed by women, for women. Our next hero, Lourdes Reyes, or Lulu as she was fondly called, would have her quiet life drastically changed by the war. Her family's world came crashing down as they listened to the radio that fateful day of April 9, 1942. Hearing news of Bataan surrender, her mother collapsed on the ground and wept for her son, Willie, who was fighting in Bataan. Lulu promised her widowed mother that she will find her brother. As the president of the Chaplain's Aid Association, she assisted priests who said mass and gave communion at the concentration camp. <clears throat> this way, she was able to find her brother. But finding her brother wasn't enough for this lady with a big heart. Father Forbes Moynihan, an Irish Jesuit, wrote in his book, Under the Red Sun, <clears throat> After the fall of Bataan, Lulu went to Tarlac with her mother to bring help to her brother, Willie, who was a prisoner. Seeing the misery of other POWs, she devoted herself to aiding them. Though it was forbidden to enter the prison camp, Lulu went to the Japanese commandant and got his permission to bring in medicine and food. She smuggled money and notes, even if she was warned, death was the penalty for doing so. It is interesting to note that both Lulu Reyes and Jose Pallanes Escoda were members of the National Memorial War Service Committee for the War Dead, formed by President Laurel for the purpose of holding a memorial service for the War Dead during All Souls Day of 1943. <clears throat> At the end of the war, Lulu Reyes was awarded the U.S. Medal of Freedom for her heroic efforts to aid American POWs. But her heroism did not end with the war. On Christmas 1945, Lulu Reyes was walking along Escolta when she saw a tired-looking woman with many children. The kind heart that she was, she took out her money and gave it to the widow. Lulu never shared this story publicly and was surprised years later when Philippine star editor Max Sullivan wrote a column which said, The best Christmas they ever had was because of the generosity of a woman named Lulu Reyes. The woman she gave the money to was Max's mother, Pelagia Solivet. After the war, Lulu got married to Gualberto Besa, and this marriage was blessed with two children, Betty Ann and Maria Isabel. She was active her entire life in religious and charitable works, was awarded the Ozanam Award of Ateneo in 1953, and the Papal Award in 1981 for her admirable service to her fellow men. 
During the war, Jose Polianes Escoda was the president of the National Federation of Women's Clubs and was a familiar figure in social civic circles. While the death march was still halfway to its destination, Jose Polianes Escoda, her husband Tony, and a group of doctors went to San Fernando to give medical aid to the captured USAFE troops. Hiding from the Japanese guards, she secretly took down names, addresses, and messages from the POWs. Upon the return to Manila, she mobilized her women's network and set them off to bring messages to the families of the soldiers. She was one of the active members of the Volunteers Social Aid Committee, bringing food, supplies, and clothing to the POWs in Cabanatuan and Capas. To raise funds, they organized several benefit shows and concerts at the Metropolitan Theater, unbeknownst to the Japanese officers attending the concerts. By early 1944, word reached the Escodas that they were being watched by Japanese spies. Perhaps sensing her imminent death, she wrote an ominous letter to Lieutenant Llanes in early 1944. I have done my duty to my country and God. To my mind, the best I have done is having helped with the little I could to save the lives of the surrendered soldiers of Bataan and Corregidor. I have offered myself as a guarantor for men, later released by the enemy, that they commit no anti-Japanese act. Men who, if they had the guts left, would continue their resistance. I have acted as guarantors not only for the sake of humanity, but also to encourage them to fight again. If you happen to survive and I fail, tell our people that the women of the Philippines did their part in making the embers sparks of truth and liberty alive until the last moment. Tony Escoda was captured in June 1944, then the Japanese came for Josefa two months later. She was last seen, beaten and weak, sometime late January 1945. Together with other resistance fighters, she was brought to the North Cemetery, where she was executed. Josefa Llanes Escoda's whole life has been one of devoted service to others. She was brave until the end, and her beautiful, courageous spirit will always be an inspiration for all Filipinos. I share the stories of this next group of women with much enthusiasm, as their, as their stories remain unknown to this day. When these teachers saw their townmates being persecuted, they said, enough is enough, put down their chalks and lesson plans, and headed for the hills. Estela Viola was born in 1921 in Bombon, Camarines Sur, graduating from Kamsor National High School, and finished her education degree at the National Teachers College in Manila. She was teaching at Lagonoy Elementary School when the Japanese occupied Naga. Hearing tales of rapes and atrocities, her father hurriedly fetched her to bring her home. Avoiding the Japanese, they trekked through Mount Isarog, a five-day journey, eating only wild fruits along the way. One day, the Japanese hung three men in the town plaza as a warning to the people. To Estella's horror, one of the men was her suitor Narvaez. She suddenly remembered the day when Narvaez asked to visit her, but never showed up, for he was taken by the Japanese. This was the turning point in her life, and she decided to join the guerrillas of Mount Isarog under the command of Teofilo Padua. She was appointed head of the Women's Auxiliary and was responsible for recruiting trusted women into the unit. One day, news reached their camp that many young men from their village, including her 15-year-old brother Pishong, were arrested, and their livestock stolen by the Japanese. She sought the help of their mayor, Mayor Parlan, and together they rode the early morning bus to Naga City. Hundreds of Japanese lined the main street with bayonets pointing at them, and they had to bow to all of them. They reached Ateneo de Naga, which the Japanese commandeered as their headquarters. She nervously asked for her brother's release and vouched that he was not a guerrilla. Detained and questioned for five hours, Estella prayed hard that the Japanese won't find out she was a guerrilla. She recalled to her children in later years that she was so terrified during the entire ordeal that she peed her pants. Her brother was released, released after some time, but he developed a physical disability due to the harsh conditions during his confinement. After the war, Estella married her childhood friend Gonzalo Aspe, a Bataan Death March survivor. Mom Tells, as she was fondly called by her students, taught for 40 more years and served her country as the oldest post commander of the Veterans Federation of the Philippines in her district. She passed on in January of this year, her amazing story left untold. 
When the Japanese landed in Leyte in May 1942, Ana Omega was teaching in the barrio of San Isidro. Though under the Jap Japanese occupation, she refused to remove the photo of President Manuel Quezon in her classroom and allowed her pupils to sing the Philippine and American national anthems. She repeatedly told her students that the Japanese regime is just temporary and in no time the Americans would return. The officials soon got wind of Anna's activities and warned her to stop this. Fired by that ominous warning, Anna fled to the hills and together with two men formed the nucleus of a guerrilla group. Before long, the unit grew in number with Anna's former pupils and their relatives as members. In October of 1942, she led her men to the town of Palompon in Wester Leyte. The Japanese fled in fear and Anna hoisted the American flag in the town plaza. She also worked as an intelligence operative for the northern Leyte guerrillas. <clears throat> Though she has done a lot for the cause, her name was not included in the roster of guerrillas because she was a woman. Today, like many other women guerrillas who were not recognized, Anna Omega remains an ignored and forgotten hero of the guerrilla movement. Nieves Fernandez was a teacher in Leyte when the Japanese arrived in May 1942. Having seen enough Japanese tortures and persecution to her townsfolk, she decided to do something about it. She organized a group of 110 men and armed only with bolos and some homemade guns and grenades, they made successful, successful raids against the enemy. They were able to kill more than 200 Japanese, and because of this, the Japanese placed a 100,000 peso bounty on her head. Undeterred, the Warai guerrillas continued their work and helped in the rescue of comfort women in Leyte. The Americans called her group the Gas Pipe Gang because of their homemade shotguns made from gas pipes, loaded with a combination of gunpowder and nails. Ms. Fernandez, the school teacher from Tacloban, is immortalized in this photo where she was showing U.S. Army Private Andrew Lupiba how to silently kill a Japanese with a bolo by severing the jugular vein. In any war, intelligence is the key to bringing about swift victory. Here are the stories of three intrepid Filipino women who acted as couriers, spies, and saboteurs. Against overwhelming odds, they fulfilled their dangerous missions right under the enemy's noses, making, a, making an American officer exclaim, By God, I never dreamed that Filipino women had such courage. Josefina Joey Guerrero was a happy young mother in the, in the 1930s, married to Dr. Renato Maria Guerrero, scion of one of the most distinguished clans in Manila. She lived a nice and comfortable life, blissfully unaware of things to come. First came the headaches, and then extreme fatigue. Then her appetite waned, and soon suspicious skin lesions appeared. Her diagnosis came. She had leprosy. For a while, she was able to keep the lesions at bay, but once the Japanese occupation began, her access to medicine was cut off. <clears throat> Rather than sulk, she decided to do something worthwhile with her life. She made contact with the guerrillas and became a courier hiding messages in her hair or inside her socks. Upon seeing her lesions, the Japanese would back away and would hurriedly, hurriedly let her go. In a way, her affliction became her passport and it became her best weapon. As the Americans returned, Joey was asked to draw maps of Japanese fortifications, minefields, and gun emplacement. <clears throat> she pretended to take strolls, but was memorizing the landscape, jotting down areas where they were freshly dug earth indicative of a landmine newly placed by the enemy. In early January 1945, she was told to deliver these maps to the American forces in Kalumpit, Bulacan. Despite extreme body ache and fatigue, she trudged the 40-kilometer route and reached Kalumpit, only to be told that the Americans had moved to Malolos. Too weak to walk, she hired a banka, carefully avoiding an ongoing battle between the hooks and the Japanese in the area. Upon reaching the American headquarters, she gave the map to Captain Blair of the 37th Infantry Division. Knowing the great distance and the extreme risk Joey went through, Captain Blair exclaimed, By God, I never dreamed that Filipino women had such courage. Because of her map, Joey saved thousands of American soldiers who would have walked right to their death. She was awarded the Medal of Freedom with Silver Palm, honoring foreign civilians who had done something courageous to save American lives. After the war, friends petitioned so she could be brought to Carville Leprosarium in the U.S. for treatment. 
the very first foreigner to be given this privilege. She was pronounced leprosy free in 1957. In the 1970s, she moved to Washington, DC. When she died, none of her friends knew of her past or of her family in the Philippines. Only when her obituary ran in a Washington newspaper did an old friend from 50 years ago surface to tell the world of her heroic past. Florence Ebersol Finch was born in Santiago, Isabella to a Filipino mother and American father. Her father, Charles, was a veteran of the Philippine-American War and opted to stay after the war. Florence worked as a stenographer for the U.S. Army in Fort Santiago under Lieutenant Colonel Englehart. She then met Navy man Charles Smith, and they, and they got married in August 1941. He was killed in action on February 8, 1942, during a mission to resupply troops in Bataan. If we take a closer look at the photo, you will see this seems like the gate of Fort Santiago, sa likod po niya. Amazing, no? During the occupation, she worked for the Japanese-controlled Philippine Liquid Fuel Distributing Union, where she was assigned to log fuel vouchers. She diverted precious fuel supplies to the guerrillas and helped sabotage shipments to the Japanese. Upon learning that her former boss, Lieutenant Colonel Engelhart, and other POWs were in very poor condition, Florence and her colleagues organized to smuggle in food, medicine, and other supplies to the prison camp. She was arrested, interrogated, and tortured for months. Her interrogators, led by a Japanese who spoke good English, electrocuted her and confined her in a two feet by four feet box for days whenever they didn't like her answers. Fed only one, bo one bowl of lugao per day, her weight dropped to a mere 80 pounds. When the Americans liberated Manila, she joined the U.S. Coast Guards to avenge her husband's death. She was discharged after the war, married Army veteran Robert Finch, Finch and raised a family. In November 1947, Recommended by her former boss, Lieutenant Colonel Engelhart, she was awarded the Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian award given by the U.S. government. In 1995, the Coast Guard honored her by naming a building for her at Coast Guard Base in Honolulu. A book about the life of this courageous woman is scheduled to launch this 2020. Magdalena Leones was a preacher's daughter and a deaconess of their evangelical church. She joined her American missionary friends who were members of the Phil American Irregular Troops. Among those in the group were Pastor Mary Boyd Stagg of the Cosmopolitan Church and civilian Blanche Jurica, mother-in-law of Commander Chick Parsons. They were helped by Lieutenant Colonel Reyes who had arrived from Australia via submarine and who was tasked by General MacArthur to coordinate guerrilla activities. Leonis was ordered by Lieutenant Colonel Reyes to get the roster of the guerrillas of Northern Luzon. The guerrillas got suspicious and took her in for questioning. She was interrogated by Colonel Russell Volkman, commander of the Northern Luzon guerrillas, and found out that she was working with the American missionaries, two of whom had saved his life earlier. Volkman sent an agent to Manila to verify her story. On the agent's return, he reported that the missionary group was tortured and beheaded by the enemy, betrayed by the sly, sweet-talking Lieutenant Colonel Reyes, who in real life was Franco Vera Reyes, a spy for the Japanese. Magdalena was beside herself in grief when she found out the fate of her friends, and this made her resolve stronger. Impressed by her earlier work in obtaining the roster, Volkman made her an intelligence agent. She was able to penetrate enemy-held territories to bring much-needed supplies and gather information. She took note of enemy installations and positions, listed down Japanese ships docked in La Union, and noted troop movement. One of her more important missions was to collect vital radio parts that the guerrillas needed so they could broadcast to General MacArthur. In October 1945, upon the recommendation of Colonel Volkman, she received the Silver Star Medal, the third highest military decoration of the United States. To date, she is the only Asian ever awarded the Silver Star Medal. Like like many other resistance fighters, she went back to her quiet life, got married, and raised a family. In 1969, she migrated to the U.S. and passed away in 2016 at the age of 96. In keeping with her final wish, her remains were brought home to the Philippines, and she was laid to rest in her most rightful place at the Libingan ng Mga Bayani.
When Filipino nurses volunteered for Bataan, they were considered civilians and did not have any ranks. Under the jungle canopy, somewhere near the tip of the Bataan Peninsula, three makeshift hospitals were built, General Hospitals No. 1 and 2 and the Philippine Army General Hospital. The first two were mostly run by American personnel and the latter entirely by Philippine medical personnel. All three hospitals were overflowing with the sick, the wounded, and the dying. Starving and overworked, the medical staff had to also contend with working under constant strafing by the Japanese. Although they were clearly marked with the Red Cross, the hospitals were deliberately bombed by the enemy. Colonel Victoriano Luna, chief of the Philippine Army's medical service, was killed while on duty when the hospital was bombed. The V. Luna, or the AFP Medical Center in Quezon City, is named after him. The night before Bataan fell, the U.S. Army Nurse Corps was ordered to evacuate to Corregidor. At first, the order only applied to the American nurses. Their volunteer Filipino colleagues were ordered to stay behind. However, 2nd Lieutenant Josephine Nesbitt, the head of the U.S. Army Nurse Corps, dug in her heels and said, If my Filipino nurses don't go, I'm not going either. Her superiors conceded, and all of the nurses, civilian and military, Filipino and American, departed for Corregidor. After the war, Captain Josie Nesbitt wrote to the U.S. Army, recommending that their 30 Filipino colleagues be awarded some recognition. An excerpt from her letter reads, They are heroines, and I feel they are very deserving of any consideration we can get for them. They were loyal as they could be to us while we were interned in Santo Tomas. And as soon as they could come into camp after our release, they were right there to rejoice with us. They suffered a great deal during those long years of war and are still having many hardships to endure. If you can give them a little public praise and a medal of some kind, I'm sure we will never regret it. Meanwhile, all over the country, nurses and doctors volunteered, many attached to guerrilla units. When the troops moved, the nurses moved with them, climbing mountains and hiking for days while taking care of their patients. Sometimes the nurses were stationed less than two kilometers from the battle to be at hand for any emergency. Um, shown in this slide is Dr. Velasquez of Laguna and our own Angels of Bataan, Dr. Gedelia Pablan and nurses Carmen Lanot and Bruna Calvan. When the Japanese burned their hospital in Bataan, they continued to serve the populace in a makeshift Nipahat hospital. Every month, Nurse Lanot rode a, ba a banca all the way to Manila to get their supplies from the Bureau of Health, the most important of which is quinine. They then gave these to the guerrillas in the mountains where malaria was really bad. Since the Japanese knew how much quinine was allocated to them, they falsified records and made up names of recipients. Many times, they went to the mountains to treat the guerrillas at great risk to their lives. Remarkably, these doctors and nurses served without any thought of financial reward or professional recognition. Many more served in far-flung areas of our country, but due to the non-combatant nature of their services, their stories remain unchronicled. They took great risks and carried on as gallantly as their brothers in arms, armed only with their Hippocratic Oath and their Nightingale Pledge to practice their profession faithfully and to dedicate their lives in devoted service to human welfare. Social scientist Mina Rosas summed it up best when she wrote, The true Filipina, as our history reveals to us, was one who was full of self-sacrifice, devotion, and loyalty. But at the same time, she had common sense and had the head to rule her heart, was brave enough to go out with her menfolk and stay by their side till the last ditch. She did, not, she did not mope at home, burning candles before her favorite saint, while her home, her children, and her country were in peril. Never did these words ring more true than during the dark days of World War II, when our women broke every possible gender barrier and proved their mettle. But why is it that their great feats of valor seem to have been forgotten in time? Now, more than ever, we need more great examples for our, our youth. Let us not make their memories fade, for these women's stories deserve to be remembered and honored by a grateful nation. Maraming salamat po. These are my references, photo sources. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kess, for that uh, very enlightening presentation. Uh, we're now going to open our 
question and answer portion. So uh, just a reminder. Uh, if you are viewing by, if you are viewing by, if you are viewing by Zoom, you can key in your questions in the Q and A button below in the bottom of the screen. And if you are viewing via Facebook, you can raise your questions in the comment section uh, below the Facebook Live. So, okay, so uh, Ms. Des, uh, our first question for today is from Zoom. So, mm. uh, the question is, was Maria Orosa ever part of a battalion or not? Or did she work alone? Oh, she was recruited by Lydia Argilia to join Martins Guerillas, although she didn't fight in the hills. She still continued her work at the Bureau of Science. But yun nga, no, her inventions uh, saved the lives of thousands. And may cute story pa dyan. When Lydia Argilia came to her and asked her to join, marami kasi kasali sa guerillas, but not really in the mountains. No? They were uh, parang secret underground agents. Uh, they gave reports to the guerillas about what's happening in the metro or ano yung troop movements. So parang nandun naka-label si Maria Orosa. So when, yung cute na story dyan, when Lydia Argilia was recruiting her, uh, sober siyang ano, excited. Sabi niya, I'm ready, willing, and able. So yung naging guerrilla name niya was Angge, but her guerrilla code, uh, yung code name na binigay sa kanya, was ready, willing, and able because she was very excited to join. And yun nga, she, uh, hinaysen niya yung paggawa niya nung soya lak and the, the rock cookie so that um, this can be brought to the camps because the people were, the, the prisoner of wars were suffering uh, severe malnutrition. Yes, I hope I answered the question. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Liz. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that Commander Li Wai Wai uh, died in 2018. 2015, I think, yes. 28 years old. And 2015, at the age of 96. 96. And Estella... 95, sorry. 2014, at the age of 95. Uh, and Estella Aspe died this year, in January. No. No. Very interesting. Because these uh, heroes are living, are still are still alive na in this very late na naabutan pa nila 2020, 20, anyway. So, my mm -hmm. uh, question is, how were they, kumusta yung later stage of their life? How were they treated? Uh, did they receive further accolades at later life? Or did they be treated to a total obscurity? Uh, for Commander Li Wai uh, I think the nice uh, nice thing about the book commanders in Pampanga is that um, sa Pampanga may Center for Kapampangan Studies, so they were studied extensively, maraming nasulat about sa kanila, uh, even books about them, no? because some of them continued with the book Balahap um, revolution after the war. So maraming mga kwento about them, there are lots of books about them, lots of articles. But for some who were in the provinces, lesser. Uh, si Estela Aspe wa, continued to be a teacher in, in Bombon, in Camarines Sur. So she was well-loved by the community. She was like a local hero there. So marami siya naging awards, but not really big awards, but Mother of the Year of Bombon, uh, Mother Butler Guild Award. A lot of awards in her hometown. But kulang yung exposure nationwide. So yun yun medyo malungkot for many. And um, nakakatuwa nga while we were um, inviting people to attend through the event page, a lot of them were sending messages na, my tita was a guerrilla, my mother-in-law was a guerrilla with the underground, ganyan, ganyan. Ang daming hindi nakakronicle na lives of women who fought in the war. So I hope this will change na, no? Bigyan natin sila ng mas maraming attention. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> But uh, but Miss Aspe was not uh, buried in the living of mga bayani. Miss Aspe, no, 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 just in ka uh, Camarines or mm. oh, ang nalibing sa living ng mga bayani is Magdalena Leones. Mm. Kasi malaming category, di ba? Para kang malibing don. So mm -hmm. pero siya nakapasok siya dun sa category. So, so in a way, her body was brought back home from the U.S. So uh, of the fifteen 
women that you discussed earlier, only one is me- is buried in the living ng mga bayani. Yes, wow, you pointed that out to me just now. That's true. Just <laughs> one. Yeah. Oh. Yep. That's uh, very it's sad, no? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, someone is raising their hand. Uh, if you would like to ask questions, you can uh, key in your question in the Q and A button below. So, right. Uh, this one is an interesting question from Zoom. Mm-hmm. Is there any hint that any of these women were feminists? I think by the way they live their lives, lahat sila, yes. <laughs> um, yun nga, no, napaka, they broke gender barriers, actually, no? Uh, especially the ones who really, you know, led their men to the front lines. Uh, I feel they are, but a lot of them were just, a lot of them said, yung mga nakapagsulat about their lives, said, we were just doing what we needed to do. Parang ganun lang. That's why, yun din yung isa, kaya hindi masyado chronicle this, because, um, a lot of them, parang feeling nila na, eh, ginawa ko lang yung dapat kong gawin. You know, without much credit, without fanfare, while much of the praise were thrown on the men, not much were on the women. But as to the question if they are all feminists, I think they are all, by heart, they are all feminists. Yeah. Uh, the mere fact that, yeah, yun, yeah, sumali sila. Yes. But in your uh, knowledge, do you think there's a particular heroine here who specifically promoted women's cause and uh, uh, involvement in the war? Well, if you remember yung last lecture natin on Sefa Llanes Escoda, siya talaga because she headed the National Federation of Women's Clubs, she was part of the women's suffrage movement, and she mobilized her women's group para hanapin yung mga pamilya ng mga Bataan Death March survivors. So I guess kung meron mga magtatop ng list natin, that would be Jose Llanes Escoda. How about uh, comfort women? Is there any particular comfort woman that we can say na would merit as a hero? Yes. Well, they all are heroes. Though. But yung pinakakilala natin, di ba si Lola Rosa Henson? So Lola Rosa Henson was a hukbalahap guerrilla. She was. Uh, napakasad nung story niya. No? Uh, when the war came, they were, in, they were in Manila. Very poor. She came from a very poor family. But her dad hindi siya acknowledge na anak eh. Kumbaga parang anak sa labas. Her dad was re- mas medyo may kaya. But the mom, sobrang hirap. So they grew up very, very poor. Uh, at the start of the war, they were living near Pasay. Um, she had to ga- gather firewood. So she went near the near the camp. And then the Japanese saw her. Three of them raped her. Okay? So dun pa lang, na-rape na siya. And then sa takot ng mother niya, they went back to her, the mom's hometown in Pampanga. And there, sa galit niya, she joined the hooks. No? E, marami kasi sa women natin na sumali in retribution kasi pinatay yung family or may ginawa sa, sa mga loved ones nila. So Lola Rosa Henson joined the hooks. So she was a courier, a uh, spy, ganyan. Sadly, in one ano, nahuli, nahuli na naman siya, inabduct na talaga siya and brought to this uh, house were parang comfort station siya, aid station siya. And a lot of them were there. They were raped nightly. Sakat sa puso, sobra pag-usapan yung comfort women. Um, so yon ginawa siya ng comfort women against their will. A lot of them were just abducted and brought there. So I think all of them are martyrs and heroes. And um, hindi yan napag-usapan after the war. Only in the 1990s, nung lumabas na yung mga story ng comfort women. And Lola Rosa, I think her pagiging hero was really coming out in 1992 or 1993 and telling the story of the comfort women. So, because of her, a lot of the, a lot of the other lolas came out and told their story as well. So, yun. Uh, yes. This one is again from Zoom. So, question ma, what can you say about the male leaders who's, uh, who are still misogynistic and still under ma- underestimating the capabilities of women knowing the legacy of Filipino women in our history and freedom. Thank you very much. Yung mga ganun pa na klase na tao, <laughs> parang nahuhuli na po kayo. <laughs> so, um, I guess, kung may ganyan pa man ka-close-minded, kakasad na sobra, di ba? So, probably there still are, but a lot, I think uh, one happy thing is, 
at least in the Philippines, mas marami pa din yung open-minded na lalaki. So, in fact, uh, comparing to other countries, di ba, uh, tayo yung may dalawa na na women president, we have women chief justices na who, who were chief justices. And nasabi ko nga kanina in my introduction that um, in the entire Southeast Asia, only the Philippines had women, a lot of women in the resistance. So, yun. So, what can I say about them? Magbago na po kayo. Hindi na uso yun. <laughs> And you stated earlier that one out of ten of the guerrillas were women. Yes. So, and I think more pa. But because of the, yun nga sabi ko, because of the non-combatant roles they served, a lot of them served like cooks. Uh, may, may nakausap ako nun na veterana. She did the, the laundry and uh, she helped cook. And she was just 13 or 14 at that time. But it was very important. Imagine, pag-uwi ng mga, uh, mga guerrillas, wala silang kakainin, walang anything, di ba? So, nung sabi niya sa akin, ay, nagluluto lamang ako, iha. Sabi ko, Lola, hindi po lamang yun kung wala kayong ginawa, eh, di ba? It's a, a, ano eh, a conglomerate of things, eh. Hindi lang naman labanan, di ba? Someone has to run the camp, someone has to tend to the sick and the dying. And a lot of women fill this role, and more than that, there, thereby breaking the gender barrier. Yes. Uh, from... From Suzanne Yupanko, so the metal and bravery of the Filipino have always been notable in our history. Noted in the episode today that most of the heroines were young. What do you think shaped the young Filipina to be the way they acted? Or were they accidental heroines? Uh, probably there were some accidental heroines. Some, you know, I said, many of them joined because you know, they had access to grind and uh, uh, may pinatay sa family member or friends. But more importantly, I think it's because of the love of country. Diba noon pa man, in, even in our earliest histories, we had Diego Silang. In the Philippine Revolution, we had a lot of mothers, mother of the revolution, mother of, diba, and daming women involved. And I think because the, in the, uh, the Filipino culture is medyo, I, I don't think this, I don't know if this is the right term of matrifocal or uh, ano tayo uh, we're leaning towards the, 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 the women parang ganyan so very important yung role ng women not only in the family but in the society as a whole so I think yun yun very supportive yung, support, yung community kaya maraming babae na nagjoin especially more in the peasant movements uh, because they, they see it as more mas equal yung gender, ganyan. Kaya sa Hukbalahap, ang dami-daming babaeng commanders. And some of them also accidental heroes, yun nga. Napasale because galit nila. But still, sumale because of love of country. Uh, were there any clubs or groups under the Hook na specifically just for women? That I do not know. Uh... Magandang tanong yan. I will research on that. I don't know if there's a specific club, but they were close. No, yung mga babae were close. But I don't know if they had a specific club for that. I love the story of, ano, yung Commander Liwayway, yung, yung nang iinis sa kanya, ng maraming sexual innuendos. Yung ano niya, hinamon niya. <laughs> okay, yun, no? <laughs> uh, aside from Josefina Borromeo Capistrano of Misamis Occidental, do you have any other candidate of a Filipino heroine from Mindanao? Uh, hindi na umabot yung research ko doon, but I'm pretty sure there are, and I've been getting a lot of messages, which later we will, sana would like to compile about the women in Vismin. Most uh, importantly, mas konti yung alam natin about the Vismin uh, women. Uh, we have a question from Bren Justin Pajardo. Uh, for everyone's knowledge, movies like Liwai, Commander Liwai, Liwai, and Haunted, A Last Visit to the Red House, uh, are released. So, <laughs> are, and this, the question is, are there any Filipina who battled against either the, Jap either the Spaniards or Americans, then also battled against the Japanese? So if there were, I'd assume that these women would be very old. Right? Yeah. World War II. But, but were there any women? Na I haven't read of any. Wala pa. But if 
kung meron man kasi by that time anong mata matanda na sila di ba like Artemio Ricarte pagbalik niya nung 1940 in your in his late 60s or early 70s na but i'm sure there are a lot who supported the guerrillas whether by providing food medicine ganyan maybe not really the physical battle but you know, all the other stuff food medicine clothing yeah uh, we have a question from facebook uh, from Cecil Francisco. Good afternoon. I am curious if the main source of information about these brave Filipinas were from military sources. I assume many documents may have been destroyed during the course of the war. So, is that the case? And if ever, are there uh, other sources aside from military sources? Right. So there are, uh, uh, if you're going to research on the hook, the women of the hook, there are a lot of books, luckily, no, available on that. Um, some of the research I made, um, I went to the PIVAO, Philippine Veterans Affairs Office website. They have the Philippine military records. But these were mostly the records gathered by the Americans when they came in 1945. So marami pa din na hindi na isulat. But luckily, they are there. There's the roster. The roster of guerrillas are there. Maraming mga makukuha din doon. So some of them military. But U.S. military yun, ha? And uh, the PIVAO uh, sent a team to scan everything there. And ngayon, we, we can see it online uh, under the PIVAO website. So yun. But kung books, there are. Uh, and if you want to read on Yai Panilio, she wrote her own auto autobiography, the Crucible, which is very, very nice. I loved reading it. Ang ganda. Even her style of writing is really very nice. And yon. But mostly for many, wala masyado. Mahirap. Mahirap maghanap. But yun nga, marami nun ngayon mga articles. Or a lot of them are military journals. Uh, U.S. military journals. Like the story of Florence Finch. Doon ko yun nakuha. Um, and sino ba ba? There are on Yai Panilion, Magdalena Leones. So... May mga here and there. We're very lucky now that you no, know, may may Google, may Scribd. Scribd also has a. Uh, Marami kaming makukuha doon. Yun. Uh, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> uh, from Alan Joy Sarah, this is a very great topic and eye-opening for the history of Filipinas. However, some of the women discussed here were not mentioned and discussed in the classroom. So the students only know a few. What do you think should be done to recognize and include these women in studies and curriculum? Because I think this topic should be known by the Filipinos and the next generation. Thank you. Yes, Alan, I agree with you. Talagang kailangan to malaman ng kapwa natin Pilipino. No? Uh, it gives you not just a sense of pride, but more than that, eh, yun, uh, involvement natin dun sa gera. Sabi ko kanina, only the Philippines in the entire Southeast Asia you know, resisted most stubbornly against the Japanese. So sadly, kung yun guerrilla leaders nga, hindi masyado nakakwento sa classroom, di ba? Yun girls pa, parang ganyan. So very sad, uh, what do we do? Maybe we should be the ones to teach our children, our pamangkins, whatever, you know, as a responsible member of society, siguro tayo na lang ang gumawa kung hindi kaya sa skwelahan. Uh, Maraming ngayon, you can research in one afternoon, sit down, marami kang makukuha sa internet. Maybe, yun nga, share via Facebook or what. And, yeah, yun, sad <laughs> na wala siya sa ating education. No? Very, very, ano, siguro yung World War II in the grade 6 Philippine history would be maybe three, four sessions. So, swerte na yun, if the teacher, you know, talks about history much. In fact, may kausap akong history teacher dati, sabi niya, Mom, why is it that we spend more time on martial law rather than World War II? So, parang sabi niya, mas nagsispend pa sila ng time doon when World War II was such a watershed in our history. So, maybe, sana we can, baka may nanonood dyan na makakatulong sa atin <laughs> to reach out to DepEd or something. At least make the textbooks more interesting, di ba? Wala eh. I saw yung textbook nung son ko dati, mali-mali pa. Picture. Mali-mali yung caption, si ano daw yun, President Laurel being sworn in. When the picture was Jose Abad Santos being sworn in as Chief Justice. Pero yung caption was Jose P. Laurel. So sa ko, paano ba ito? Yung gumagawa ng textbooks, mali. Paano ba yun? So, yun. And some of the teachers, uh, I know some, Sir AJ might be watching from Miriam. Very progressive yan si Sir AJ. 
um, sila mismo na yung lumalapit sa groups like us, Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation and a lot of other groups to help them with their curriculum. What can they add? And we will gladly help also if the teachers watching here, we can give you uh, pointers, we can give you, you know, visuals and everything to help, you know, spice up your lecture in the class. Medyo mahirap pa intindihin sa bata yung gera, di ba? But, yun nga, very important part of our history. Yes. Is there any group right now na, na are focused on the promotion of female figures from the Second World War? Promotion of what? Sorry, Ranch. Promotion of, of? Female figures from the Second World War. Female figures? I don't think so that there's this one ano lang, group. Wala sa ngayon. Wala sa ngayon. Uh, yun pa isa, no? yun sa history natin, parang World War II was just three and a half years, four years. Parang it's just a blink of an eye kumpara doon sa previous, you know, long colonial history natin. Kaya rin siguro ang liit-liit nung time na spend sa classroom about this. So, sana tayo isupplement din, isupplement natin mga bata, you know, uh, look for films, books that can, uh, you know, entice them to learn more about uh, the World, World War II history. Bring them out. Ang dami natin magagandang museo. Mga NHCP museums, intramuros museums, napakaganda. And you'll come out from the museums learning a lot. So, sana yung parents, instead of just going to malls or or whatever, uh, dali natin yung mga anak natin sa museum. Maraming matututunan. And I bet you, they will love it. They will love it. My children love going to museums. Akala lang natin, boring sa kanila, no. Gusto nila yon And marami silang mak makukuha. Yeah. Uh, our next question is from Zoom. Uh, in recent history, the 1986 People Power Protest, for instance, we see nuns in the front lines. Uh, were there any narratives of resistance among convents and nunneries during the height of the war? Um, yung talagang resistance, like uh, doing work or ano no. Medyo wala akong na-come across. There was, there was this one uh, RVM sister, forgot her name, na nabasa ko, no? Although she, was a she wasn't a nun pa at the time, so she became a nun after the war. But she was very religious already. But uh, walang talagang masasabing, mas marami sa priests na lumaban, no? Pero yung nuns, mas, mas low-key. Siguro mas, uh, mas takot din kasi, syempre, babae. There's... Ang mahirap pa sa women resistance fighters is it's not just the threat of you know being killed in battle, being tortured by the enemy. The threat of rape was was very very there in their face, no? So yun yung isang masasabi ko na bakit ang ang ano ang galing ng kababaihan na sumali pa rin sa resistance, di ba? Uh, so yun. But there are a lot of uh, convents who help you know, or hid the mga resistance fighters. Yun, mas mas maraming ganon dan yung talagang lumaban and and takipagsalimuha sa sa enemy. But a lot of them were supportive, bringing food. Tapos uh, a lot of the like si Yai Panilio when her ki, she had three kids eh, during the war, but she had to go to the hills. So yun anak niya uh, nilipat-lipat ng friends, no? Tinulungan pati ng mga ibang religious friends niya. So ganon yun help na nabigay ng mga madre. Yeah, but I I assume that even the fact that they were hiding uh, uh, in, in people in their convents, that was already very heroic, no? Yes, yes, yes. Very scary, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Lagot sila talaga pag nahuli sila. They're Lagot. risking not just their lives, but also yes. the life of the entire community. Right, 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 right. Uh -huh. What uh, from Ellen Election? Uh, why is it that majority? of guerrillas, heroin act that has been recognized for men and only few from women like uh, Jose Pagalis Escoda. Is it because of our culture as a Filipino that we wanted to show that women are just dedicated to stay at home, nurture, and take care of the kids? If they said women now are empowered to do equal rights as men can do, but as shown in your presentation, women before are not be strong and empowered too. So I think the question is, if I may if I may hear my the question, uh, do you think yung limited recognition natin for female figures uh, of the war, could it be attributed to our deep-seated uh, 
misogyny as a group, as a country, and that uh, and that uh, it limited us from looking for more Filipina mm -hmm. women who are actually existing, and as a result, they they retreated in obscurity. So, what do you think? Yes. Um. So, tingin ko parang dalawang bagay. Eh. First, a lot of the women, when I read those who were able to write their memoirs, in the end, they would always say, "I just did what I had to do." Parang hindi hindi big deal sa kanila. So, uh, in fact, yai panilio when she wrote um, General General Whitney or Colonel Whitney, sabi lang niya, "I'm not seeking for anything. I just did what I had to do." I felt like you know, kailangan ko lang siyang gawin. So, probably that's one. So, hindi nilang masyado pinush yung kanilang role, no? Maybe because nga, male-dominated pa rin yung world na yon, lalo na in the guerrilla world, no? Um, secondly, yun nga, yung iba just, you know, they went back to the kitchen, child-rearing and all. Um, parang pinabayaan pa din na yung lalaki yun mag, yung mabigyan ng praise. And isa pa din dyan, yun mga guerrilla groups who did not see the women as heroes. So parang nangyari yung isa kong shinere, si yung isang teacher, si Ana Omega. Though she started the guerrilla group, she did successful raids, even brought 100 kavans of rice to Iloilo uh, at the expense of her, you know, at the risk, at her own risk. In the end, hindi siya sinama ng guerrilla officer sa roster because she was a woman. So, you know, it's, it's a, I think the point of view of the guerrilla officer, kung paano niya iti-treat yun, yung pagsalin ng women. And secondly, the women themselves, yun nga, parang wala lang for them. Uh, they, they just did what they had to do and took a back seat again. Uh, yun, yun yung sa tingin ko. I hope I answered the question. But yun nga, no, they're really, really, sabi nga, they're notably strong. Kakabilib, di ba? Very. When I was doing, I I enjoyed doing research about this because I just felt like, wow, if if this will happen to us right now, kaya kaya na, <laughs> kaya kaya ng generation ngayon, no? Imagine women being electrocuted, you know, pag ayon sa gut mo, i electrocute ka or uh, i confine ka sa two feet by four feet box for days. Kaya ba natin yun ngayon? Parang ganyan. Eh, hindi nga lang tayo makalabas sa quarantine, nagagalit na yung mga tao. <laughs> so. Yun. So I guess uh, you now we have a, a duty to perform, to let people know, let the world know uh, what our women did during the war. Yeah. Uh, I noticed earlier in your presentation that most of the women presented were actually single and were married after the war. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would have made a difference if these women were married and had children during the war? I think mas matapang yung married na may anak kung sasali because there's a lot at stake, di ba? Not just not just you but your children. Yun nga si Yai, her children had to be had to transfer from house to house sa friends kasi uh, kukunin ng hapon, no? So nakakabilib talaga yung mga married na mas maraming at stake, di ba? Of course when you're single, parang at least ikaw lang kung mahuli ka ng hapon, ano, di ba? Walang masyadong uh, attachments, pero yung married, mas nakakatakot. So, the difference there, I think, is, is also, if the husband is very supportive, then yes, you can join. But if the husband was sakot, or, you know, at that time, syempre, iba rin yung, iba yung, ano nun, di ba? Iba yung atmosphere nun. So, I think that's the main difference, yun nga. If you were still willing to go, despite all the threats, all the risks, then, galing, galing sobra. Did I answer it, Ranch? <laughs> um, we're actually uh, already done with the 30-minute uh, q and &A, But mm -hmm. there are a lot of questions. Would you like to extend for another 10 minutes? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And Basta masasagot ko po. Walang problema. <laughs> we are actually... Uh, we still have time, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope. Okay, so from... Emelita Samala from Zoom. Uh, please give us a brief discussion on the role of women from Mindanao who fought during the war. Did they also, did they do the same service done by those from Luzon and Visayas? So, uh, how would you compare the involvement of the 
women, from Luzon and Visayas, from the women from Mindanao. Is there any difference at all? Okay. Um, judging from what the Women Auxiliary Service, yun grupo ni Josefa Capistrano, in Misamis Occidental, judging from what they did and the risks that they took, I think it was same everywhere, no? Uh, it's still, still a great risk to their lives to join the resistance. So it's the same patriotism, same same um, love of country that spurred them to join. I think it would be the same. Um, siguro yung, yung tindi lang sa Luzon was there was more fighting here, more bakbakan, especially during the liberation. Siguro yung, if ever yun yung magiging slight difference. But I think that the roles are the same. Uh, they were there to, to uh, some of them lead the men in the front lines, but mostly uh, to tend to sick and the dying and the wounded, uh, help in the camp, and do, uh, importantly, the underground work. Because women then, must free to move around. So, must, pag lalaki, must suspicious yung Japanese. So, the women are very good in intel and um, spying work because they were more free to go around. Tapos, they, they were able to hide messages in their palda, in their, um, anong tawag dyan, yung, ter yung saya, ganyan, in their hair, some of them hid it in, the, in their buns, yung mga small messages. And, mas, kumbaga, mas hindi suspicious yung Japanese sa kanila. Kaya, they were very, very good in uh, doing intel work. Yun ang masasabi ko, ng galing ng babae. <laughs> yes. Uh, our next question is, did you notice any trend when it comes to which socio-economic class most of these women here so probable to belong to? Was social class a factor or is it of ano? Kasi uh, many of them are actually educated. Scientists, mm. teachers, uh, married to well-off families. Was it a factor? What about the women who are poorer than most of these women, these uh, women presented? Do you think it has something to do with social economic class? With social, social economic. Okay, very good question. Uh, I think what's really amazing about the Philippine resistance is that it encompassed all, eh. rich or poor, young and old, lahat yan. So, masasabi natin na yung hukbalahap was a peasant movement, right? And empowered din yung women doon. But if you look at the, yung um, underground in, sa resistance, sa spying sa Intel in Manila, a lot of them were, were rich women or educated or, you know, in the higher echelons of society. So, masasabi natin na na-encompass niya lahat. Uh, yun yung maganda sa kanya. So, amen to that na buo, buo talaga siya, rich or poor, uh, sumali talaga sa underground. Kaya nga minsan pag sinasabi ng the Japanese were claiming, galit na galit sila because hindi nila makuha yung Pilipina, di ba? Hindi makuha yung puso. Sabi nila that, you're all guerrillas. Ganyan, ganyan. Partly true, di ba? <laughs> A lot of the people were really, uh, ayaw, ayaw talaga natin magpa-under sa kanila. And so everybody really fought in one way or the other, you know, providing intel, providing food to the guerrillas. So talagang sinuportahan yung resistance. So yeah, so the socioeconomic class, I think, we encom the Philippine resistance uh, really encompassed all the social economic groups. Ay, isa pa palang dagdag doon. I used to think earlier on, before I did this uh, um, research, I used to think yung markings guerrillas when I read about them, um, sasabi grassroots, um, they were farmers and fisher folks. But when I read the crucible, yung kayay, a lot of Manila intellectuals joined them in the underground. So, hindi natin masasabi yung isang group na maybe majority of the fighting people were uh, grassroots. But a lot of the, the isang malaking grupo kasi may intel, may ganyan, di ba? A lot of them naman were educated in educated people from Manila. We have Maria Orosa, Lydia Argilia, Manuel Argilia, who was the, the most celebrated writer of that time. But they were all with the markings guerrillas. So, yun yung maganda dun, no? parang nagkabuklod-buklod ba? Uh, regardless of of mayaman ka, mahirap ka, bata ka, matanda ka. So, yun. I think, uh, yun yung isang magandang aspect doon. Uh, our next question is uh, from Facebook. Mm -hmm. Very interesting and informative presentation, Mandes. Congratulations. One question. Did Maria Orosa get any royalties for her main inventions? 
And if I may add, were her inventions patented under her name? Oh, very nice question, no? I don't think, because maybe she was working for the government. So, I don't think ipapatent yon under her, no? She was working as a at the Bureau of Science. Uh, by the way, good afternoon, Tita Charito. Tita Charito Hilario is watching. She's the niece of Maria Orosa. So, her dad and Maria Orosa were sisters. Um, as to the patent feeling ko hindi because she was with the government. In fact, they made a, ano, in the 1970s, her niece wrote this cookbook of all her recipes. So, meaning it's, uh, you know, being shared to the public. So, tsaka parang feeling ko hindi niya i-deprive yung, <laughs> yung country of her um, inventions. Kasi yun nga yung kanyang, ano eh, yun yung kanyang uh, goal is to make the Philippines reliant. Hindi tayo mag- uh, rely on us uh, uh, to make the Philippines, you know, self sufficient, not reliant on imported food products. So, the banana ketchup, don't forget, every time you eat your banana ketchup, think of Maria Orosa. <laughs> yes. Uh, ano Meron pa bang question dun kay Maria Orosa, Ranch? Aside from patent? Uh, uh, wala naman. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, wala sana yun, uh, but I think I can proceed to the next question. All right. This one from Emmanuel Ortega. Uh, whatever whatever happened to Franco Vera Reyes, the Filipino double agent and traitor? So, was he ever caught and punished for his crimes? Mm -hmm. Nakakagigil siya, no? Nakakagigil siya. Nung nag-research ako, gigil na gigil ako sa kanya. <laughs> anyway, Franco Vera Reyes, this sly, sweet-talking traitor, nawala na lang siya naglahong parang bula. And I read an article which said that, yun nga, probably it was also the Japanese who killed him, no? Because the Japanese naman did not like traitors also, eh. Kaso wala lang silang choice, diba? But a lot of theories then of the underground people then, after the war, uh, all of them thought that it was also the Japanese who, you know, nagligpit kay Franco Vera Reyes. So, naglaho na lang siya, eh. And even before, he was really a you know, very deceptive guy. He was involved in, before the war, he was involved in forging checks, mga ganyan. So, parang talagang hindi mo pagkakatiwalaan yung tao na yun. <laughs> yes. Uh, from, from Dennis, uh, I think this, we can accommodate one last question. Uh, from Dennis Roland Castanos, how, how about uh, Muslim women? Were there any heroines during? Uh, were there any Moro heroines during the Japanese occupation? Muslim Moro Moro. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Muslim women were. Ah, yes, there were. There were. Uh, there was this kilalang princess. Forgot her name. Uh, she was yeah. with Josefa Capistrano. In fact, in the women's auxiliary service, and uh, she helped in the resistance. Um, in fact, she became mayor in the 1970s in in one part of Mindanao. There were, there were. Uh, baka dapat magka part two, ano, ranch ng mga <laughs> vismin naman. Yeah, and I hope maraming mag-share mag din ng mga, mga stories nila there, people from the vismin. Forgot the name of that princess that was with them. Yes. Naalala ko din eh. Alam, alam ko yan eh, princess... Diba? Meron eh. Nakalimutan ko yung name. <laughs> oh, oh. And she was very active in, ano, in her province. She even became a politician or a, an elected officer in the 1970s. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting kasi royalty din. Mm -hmm. Princess. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so that's uh, our last question for today. We have a lot of questions still in Zoom and Facebook, but due to limited time, we can only accommodate so, ano, so much. So, uh, if you have any more questions, and for those who are genuinely interested in the topic, feel free to contact Ms. Des Benipayo via her email, desiree.benipayo at gmail.com. So, you can contact her for your questions. Feel free to do so. And for those who would like to ask for a PowerPoint, uh, you can request directly uh, from Ms. Des. Now, uh, We'd also like to announce that the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation is uh, 
uh, has a call for stories. So, do you have any family stories from World War II? Let us chronicle them. So, please send your stories to Philip at uh, philwarfoundation at gmail.com or message us at Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation or you can uh, contact Miss Des directly via her email as presented earlier. Uh, Miss Des, would you like to say something about this? Yes, um, I was very um, uh, natutuwa, no? when, when we started uh, posts for inviting them to this uh, webinar. A lot of people messaged me saying, oh, did you know my mom-in-law was a guerrilla? Uh, my aunt was, um, you know, a translator. Uh, one of my friends just texted me kanina. Her aunt was a translator in, for the Japanese ha, in Silai. But she, through her, her townsfolk, were her, her townsmates were, were given food, medicine by the Japanese because she yung parang nag -mediate. But at the same time, she was also... Um, telling the guerrillas kung ilan ba yung Japanese dun sa kampo, mga ganyan, di ba? So, ang dami nagpapadala ng mga message about their lolos, um, mothers, titas, na lola, na guerrilla pala yung lola nila. So, I hope if you have stories, let's chronicle them. Please write us, uh, email us at philwarfoundation at gmail.com or message us through Facebook. I-chronicle po natin. Uh, let us post them. Para malaman ng mundo, yun nga, kanina, a lot of the questions would, would be about why does you know, our fellow Filipino, our fellow Filipino don't know about these amazing women. So time for us to, you know, to, to tell their stories. So if you have stories, please write us and let us know about them. Lalo lalo na yung mga nagte-text po kanina. I hope you can send in pictures as well. Uh, do natin malalaman yung mga, ano eh, mga magagandang story, yeah, di ba? And yun, maybe this can be a book, whatever, in the future, but please do send. Especially in the Vismin, medyo kulang tayo doon. Uh, in the Vismin portion. Yun. And maybe if some of the uh, veterans are very old, maybe the foundation can go and interview, no? Yes, yes. Matapos lang tong quarantine, no? Yeah. Oh, and one more, may nag-message pa sa akin, Raj. If, I don't know if you're familiar with, nung bata ko, kilalang kilala yun, Merced Bake Shop. Yeah. You know that, di ba? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Sevilla pala, the, the owner of Merced, was a guerrilla. So oh. I might be able to interview the daughter soon. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> Parang, wow. You, you know, I think that's the magical thing about these women. After the war, you know, they did a lot of things na tumulong sa society. Yan. Ms. Merced was a by name in the 70s, 80s, no? Uh, Lydia Argilia, you know, spurred the Philippine modern art uh, community. Ang gagaling, di ba? It's not just during the war, but also their lives before and after the war. The things that they did that, you know, helped our society. So please, if you have stories, please send us. That would be a good, uh, ano, uh, maganda pong i-post yan, pati pictures po sana. Yun. And then we'd like to invite you to another webinar on August 15. Here. On August 15, it will be a, a webinar about the liberation naman po, the aftermath of World War II. I will be joined by Dr. Rico Jose of UP Diliman, James Scott, of course, we had James Scott in May, no, with uh, the Intramuros webinar. And Ms. Cecilia Gerlan of Bataan Legacy. I hope you can all watch. This is going to be a very beautiful discussion on August 15, 8 a.m. So you can register as early as now. Uh, please go to the Ayala Museum or uh, Filipinas Heritage Library website. And then you can register there. Uh, it's going to be on August 15, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Free also to the public. Uh, this is interesting, no, because a lot of discussion was about the war and destruction, but rarely about what happened after that. So, for those who are... Mga marami, marami sa Facebook, di ba, would post old pictures of Manila, ang ganda-ganda, tapos after, anong nangyari? May mga daming mga ganyan na discussion. Yeah. So, now, if you will watch this, you'll know what happened. Why were we so short-changed? Bakit hindi tayo nabayaran ng nang dapat ibayad sa atin, mga ganun po. So, I hope you can watch this. Mark your calendars, August 15, 8 a.m. Yes. And don't forget to follow us. So, the Intermodus Administration is available in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, uh, we have a lot of future episodes uh, this coming weeks. So, stay tuned to our announcements. Follow us by social media. And follow us well. 
our partner for today's episode, the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation. They are available in Facebook and in YouTube. Uh, and don't forget to send in your stories. <laughs> yes. And for those who came in late today or for those who missed this episode, do not worry because later we're going to upload this uh, episode in our YouTube channel. So uh, later uh, in, in 24 hours, so we're going to upload. So just key in uh, Intramuros Administration at YouTube. Or you can go directly to this link, bit.ly slash IAILS. So, all caps, IAILS. And don't forget to subscribe. Yes. And we are available in Google Arts and Culture as well. So, if uh, you are interested in antiques and in church artifacts, our museum collection is bit by bit being digitized and uploaded by our channel, at the Google Arts and Culture. Just key, just key in in the Moore's administration. And uh, to promote our nearest talks, so next Friday, August 7, we're going to have part two of Trademarking Philippine Heritage in Pursuit of Seasonary Geographical Education. So part two will be about Protecting Agricultural Produce. Uh, part one, which was yesterday, was about indigenous textiles. For part two of trademarking Philippine heritage, we'll be, we'll be talking about agricultural produce, featuring Patrick Belisario, Fernando Cialcita, and Estela Duque. And the day after that, Saturday, next Saturday, August 8th, uh, we're going to have a talk on the Burnham Plan and on the 1941 Frost Arellano Plan for Quezon City. So we're going to explore what worked, what did not, and why. So it's a very interesting topic for urban planners out there, for history enthusiasts, and for students. So please stay tuned for our announcements and uh, for the registration link which we will post via our social media channel so that's about it for today uh, miss des would you like to say have uh, to say some final words uh, you're on mute po. thank you to everybody who watched i hope we have given you a bird's eye view of the role of women in the resistance and this is something that we should be proud of are the role of our women in the resistance. Uh, again, on August 15, po, another webinar on the liberation um, uh, of Manila with the Filipinas Heritage Library. And uh, watch out for our future talk webinar again with Rancho and Entomores Administration. We will be having a guest from Arthur Memorial Museum and Library. Yes. So watch out for that. It's going to be on September. September 5th? September 5, yes. Yeah. It will be our 29th. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is the 21st, so on our 20, 29th episode, All right. yes, will be joining us again. Yes. So, kasi ano po yun, we're going to commemorate the, that would be, the, September 2 was the surrender of Japan, right? So, we're commemorating that end of World War II with that talk. Uh, our guest will be James Zobel of the MacArthur Memorial Library and Museum. Right. right. Thank you very much, Rancho. Thank you, Intramuros. Thank you, Thank so you Attorney G. Thank you. Uh, Have a good day, everybody. Everyone. Thank you. All so, right. Bye for now.